that we are very excited. This is our first kind of in-person Chicago in Focus in a really long time. Um, you know, our relationship with the Union League Club has been many years of doing this programming, and you know, we really uh, value and appreciate sort of this partnership on educational programming in this series. My name is Jane Ruby. I'm president of the Chicago League of Women Voters, and I'm just gonna sort of do a brief introduction before we get started. So the League of Women Voters of Chicago is a nonpartisan grassroots organization working to protect and expand voting rights and ensure everyone is represented in our democracy. We empower voters and defend democracy through advocate, advocacy and education. League of Women Voters of Chicago continues to pursue its goals through a range of voter service activities, including voter registration drives, disseminating information for voters, participating in poll watching, and hosting candidate debates and forums. Also through education of its members and the public to lobbying the government on select issues, and through ob observation of the functioning of governmental bodies to monitor their accountability and transparency. In the past few years, uh, League of Women Voters of Chicago has worked on some inspiring projects, including the passing of legislation turning Cook County Jail into a polling site. Our democracy remains a work in progress. Even if it takes another century, the League will see it through. So on that note, I'll pass it over to uh, Jeff Gray, who is with the Union League Club, to do a brief introduction. Well, thank you, Jane. Uh, my name is Jeff Gray. I'm fairly new uh, to the Union League Club. I'm acting as their uh, Director of Public Affairs. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the club, the club has been around for over 140 years. And a big piece of that time, uh, they have been uh, staunch advocates on certain issues and topics that are important to the club members. And we're the only private club that has a public advocacy um, face to the organization. And uh, we operate through a uh, subcommittee uh, structure uh, that starts with the Public Affairs Committee, and then that branches out to at least eight um, different subcommittees. Uh, those subcommittees range from uh, gender equality subcommittee, race relations subcommittee, uh, all the way through uh, to military and veterans affairs subcommittee. So we have a broad range of interests uh, that the club members have, and we pursue those actively. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. You're welcome. Um, so welcome, everybody, and thank you for your patience in our uh, getting started with Zoom. Um, hybrid format is always uh, fun to figure out together. So my name is Matt Evans. I'm the managing ecologist for Woodlands at the Chicago Botanic Garden, and I'm happy to introduce today our two speakers. Um, first, we'll have Isa Redlinski from the Forest Preserves of Cook County. Isa's work includes a rich background in many of the habitats of Illinois and Northeast Illinois through her work, and now she is the deputy director, or yeah, the deputy director of resource management at the Forest Preserves of Cook County. And we have with us tonight also Benjamin Cox, Cox, who is the executive director of Friends of the Forest Preserves, which is a nonprofit that has been supporting the Forest Preserve District of Cook County for many years in many different capacities, which you'll hear about too. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Isa and we will begin our presentation. Thank you, can everyone hear me just fine? And may I ask you to share the presentation? So welcome everyone, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you to the Union League Club and the League of Women Voters for having us and uh, giving us an opportunity to talk about uh, the Forest Preserves of Cook County. Uh, I am fairly new with the Forest Preserves. I came back uh, as an employee seven months ago. However, I am a lover of Forest Preserves for a long time. I've been an active volunteer for over seven years. I still volunteer once a month on uh, Sundays as a steward at Brookfield Woods Prairie. If you'd like to come and volunteer with me, it's for Sundays of the month. Um, it's a plug. Uh, but today I am here to tell you about the important work that we are doing as forest preserves and more importantly, or maybe more um, specifically, the resource management department. 
So just a little brief history about the forest preserves of Cook County. We are a separate PACS body, although we have the same commissioners as the Cook County government. And the work to get the forest preserve started have been around for a little over 100 years, started in the early 1900s uh, when people started being interested in preserving land for the urban communities uh, for enjoyment, relaxation, and health. Um, and in 1913, a law was passed in Illinois that allowed for forest preserve districts to exist. And, um, and then in 1914, people went out and voted to allow for Cook County forest preserves uh, to happen, um, which is fantastic because we already have a history of people voting for um, ways to uh, preserve nature for nature's sake, but also for people's sake in our area. And then this was an inspiration for a statewide and a national movement. We are the first forest preserves in our country. And our mission is to acquire, restore, and manage lands for the purpose of protecting and preserving public open space with its natural wonders, significant prairies, forests, wetlands, rivers, streams, and other landscapes with all of its associated wildlife, <coughs> natural state for the education <coughs> and recreation of the public now and into the future. Uh, and we have quite a job to do. There's 70,000 acres, almost. We're almost there. And if you look at it, it is 11% of Cook County. And if you were to take all of the forest preserves and put them into the city of Chicago, that would be 49% of the city's footprint. So it's fairly significant. And we have such amazing biodiversity. We have 27 nature preserves. So nature preserves are like national parks on the state level uh, in our county. And we have most biodiversity of all the uh, counties in Illinois, even the Southern counties. And we have a lot of, because there's preserved land, because there's unique habitats, meaning uh, areas that have different vegetation that also support unique, unique insects and um, other wildlife. We have woodlands, savannas, wetlands, and prairies. If, if you look at it ecologically, uh, prairies and some wetlands, um, they're, the reason why they're prairies is because there is no uh, shade in there, pretty much a lot of sun exposure. There are no trees. As you're beginning to have a little more tree growth, that becomes a savanna. And then with more dense vegetation, what many people would uh, call a forest, it's a woodland. Actually, a forest is like hardly any sun hitting the ground, and we have very few in our county, but that's what people refer to in a um, just colloquial way. And all that habitat supports a wide array of rare uh, animals. We have bald eagles nesting at bossy woods. We have blending turtles. Those are endangered turtles. We just had some released uh, through a program with Shed Aquarium where they raise them and we release them into our wetlands. We have uh, black crown night herons. We even have otters and we know they move around. We have the first national urban otter project where we track those and we try to study and see how they move around because no one knows how they move around in urban settings. And because of all of that, we have a whole bunch of different endangered and threatened species, both on the state and federal level such as the Eastern Prairie French Orchid, which is threatened uh, federally, the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly, that is a uh, federally endangered um, insect. Same with uh, the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. We have a lot of these sightings. So when we go and try to protect this land, we just don't do it nilly-willy. You know, like, oh, I have a special relationship with this piece of uh, forest preserves because it's near my house. No, like, we went through a very systematic process to identify our priorities through the Next Century Conservation Plan and the Natural and Cultural Resources Master Plan. So we have a guiding document that we follow with goals that we um, you know, try to reach. And there's four different goals. And the nature goal is the one that speaks most to our department. Um, and here are our rankings. So you can see all of the pieces of land and color. Those are the forest preserves but the 30,000 acres that we identified as uh, our priority areas that we hope to restore first are the uh, places um, marked in yellow, and those are, they're listed here. And also our stewardship sites are in the priority acreage. So the way it works 
We can have a la large landscape such as the payload preserves. Those are huge. And then within the landscape, we have units and we you know, categorize which unit is more important than another unit in protecting. And then within that unit, we have subunits. So if a certain amount of money falls into our lap or we have an opportunity to apply for a grant, we don't have to be like, oh, what's the next place to go? We already know. We have a prioritization pro process. It's listed. It's easy. If it fits the grant, we're applying for it. And Friends of the Forest Preserves have been fantastic partners, and they apply for a lot of these grants on our behalf. So this is the mission of our department, is to protect, restore, preserve the biodiversity and beauty of natural communities of the district as nearly as may be in their natural condition for education, pleasure, and recreation of the public. So notice the natural condition. We are trying to preserve what's out there so it doesn't get um, further affected. And then the areas that had been negatively impacted, bring it back to a functional, healthy ecosystem. Now we're not thinking of some untouched nature that you know we have this romantic um, idea of what nature was, but we know people have lived on this landscape, but they lived with the landscape. They had natural uh, disturbances that they introduced, such as fire, that kept the land going, kept it healthy. So we try to mimic those and restore that. So what is restoration? Because I've been throwing that word around and. With different paradigms, you know, people might think of health, restoring health, uh, like physical human health, or restoring a piece of art, as I'm looking at these beautiful paintings around us. But uh, ecological restoration is bringing health and functionality of the landscape. And you do it differently because every piece of land is different. It has a different history of use or abuse. Um, but there are a few different things that you want to do first. Um, there's a good picture of what we can do a before and after. Uh, here we have a lot of invasive brush. Uh, a lot of it originated in other continents. It was brought here for different purposes, escape. Uh, years of neglect or not enough funding allowed honeysuckle and buckthorn, those are two big ones, to spread. And really what they do is they're the first things that leaf out in spring, the last things that lose their leaves. No sun hits the ground. And as you can see on the before picture, do I have a little light here? Ah, oh, great. On the before picture, there's hardly anything growing on the ground layer. And then when we remove a lot of the brush, introduce fire, sometimes the seed bank reacts on its own. Sometimes we have to bring back the seeds too and recreate the plant community that we think should be there. Um, magic has happened, uh, but it takes a lot of work patients, resources, adaptive management. It's not one and done. And even when we say we've restored a piece of land and it does become a nature preserve, it's, our work is never done. We're so fragmented that we have to sort of keep the line. I mean, I don't wanna use like military war language, but a little bit. If you, um, so, okay, I sort of jumped uh, there. And one of the ways we do it is with fire. We have one of the, I think we have the biggest urban fire, prescribed fire management in all of United States. I mean, this is impressive. And you will look, uh, oh, hold on. I'll have a different chart later on that shows how our uh, fire program has uh, grown over the years. We now have crews, all of our crews are trained in fire. We hire contractors. We not employ, but we engage our volunteers, our partners, and then when those fire days are right, it's all hands on deck and it's exciting. But it's not like we just go out there, we prepare a lot of it. Our fire um, season is usually around, you know, after two hard frosts, and due to climate change, that date has been pushed, usually around November. Uh, but we've had crews mowing fire break lines, so we don't have, you know, bonus acres or unexpected expansion of where we thought the fire would be. And it's tricky to burn here because we have 5 million people living in the area. And uh, that, you know, that provides uh, a little bit of um, complication here and there. But our team, um, our research management department is uh, divided into a few different sections or teams. We have a project management team. They're fantastic. They deal with our 
uh, contractors uh, that do a lot of our restoration. So a lot of times when we get grant money, we hire contractors. However, we know that the processes to hire contractors can take forever, right? Like uh, putting out an RFP to bid and then you get the money uh, and then the grant is over. So we have developed processes that allow us, allow us to both do the bidding, but also have a preferred set of contractors that we work with to move fast on these. And through that, we've been able to clear more than people had expected. Uh, and we spend sometimes up to $5 million a year in grants um, on some restorations. So it's, it's fairly impressive. We have a fisheries department. The fisheries department manages over 20, 2,000 acres, sorry, of uh, water bodies. Uh, we have fisher, uh, fishable lakes. We stock between quarter to half a million of fish every year into 22 lakes uh, for people to fish. We have fishing tournaments for high schoolers. There's ice fishing. I never knew we can ice fish in uh, Cook County until recently. It's pretty fantastic. And we have a wildlife team. And they not only make sure that our bald eagles and ospreys and wood ducks and other rare things are thriving and there's habitat for them, but because we are so fragmented and affected, we don't have some of our apex predators, wolves. Uh, so they do have to manage some of the other wildlife that becomes problematic. They also test for a lot of these diseases and take samples to hold on to. So we had Department of um, Disease Control uh, contact us a lot of times for our samples because they wanna make sure or check when did a certain disease make itself known on a landscape because most of the human diseases, about 80%, come from animals, our zoonotic disease, just like COVID. So by us taking those samples, sending them to federal or state labs, and also having a repository of our own, we're able to help out with health, um, public health crisis as well. We have a fantastic ecology team, five regional ecologists and a senior ecologist, and they sort of coordinate everyone to work on specific areas, what to do, control the quality, uh, really highly skilled people. And then our resource programming uh, that comes through Conservation Corps. So we have a team that works with our partners, such as the Friends, you can see Friends Crews here, uh, that hire youth, uh, and that's high school and young adults, as well as people with a uh, history of um, like social justice issues and others to uh, give them jobs skills and teach the next generation that's more diverse um, to, to be part of this field, which is uh, amazing. And so much youth and so we have thousands of alumni now. And then we have resource crews. Right now we have five. We hope that one day we'll have six. And they're uh, not only like surgeons with their chainsaws, they're amazing. Uh, they keep our um, parking lots, trails, roads clean after big storms. Uh, they do a lot of other work, uh, but keeping the public safe is probably, I would say 75 to 90% of their job. Very skilled people as well. And then all of us participate in prescribed fire. That's a big part, as I said, and you can see how our program has grown over the years. There was a little bit of a dip during COVID years, but we're bringing these numbers right back up. We also rely on the volunteer resources department and work with volunteers or ecologists, work together with them to have goals and management fee, uh, management plans. Like I, like I said, I'm bought into this program because I'm a volunteer myself. And you can do not only stewardship volunteering, but you can do educational volunteering or volunteering in one of our six nature centers. And this is some of the results. I really like this picture because on the left you see, oh, on the right maybe, you see, um, what the area looked like. You have buckthorn, probably multiflora rose, some other things that have overgrown. No light is hitting the ground. And the light is sort of the machine, the engine behind an ecosystem, right? Like plants take the sunlight magically through photosynthesis. They create uh, molecules and glucose and all of that fuels the ecosystem. This is what the insects will rely on and the birds will rely on the insects, etc. So without the sunlight, nothing else can happen. By clearing the brush, we are able to let the sunlight in and then 
allow for the land to start healing itself and if it needs help with extra seed or control of other invasive species, we're there to do that. And then of course, let's not forget about the ecosystem services that nature gives us. I mean, it's beautiful. It provides habitat for so mu much wildlife. But we're also, I mean, I'm gonna probably get yelled at for that. We're the kidney of the county. 80% of the storm water in Cook County goes through our land. We're the 11% of the land and 80% of the storm water travels through us. By having a restored landscape. So I'll, can I go back? Yes, so this versus this, the grasses that you see here have really long roots. Those roots, when the water falls, they penetrate through the soil, make tiny little holes and divots. The water gets in there, water gets absorbed. It will make itself through the system, but at a much slower rate. What does that mean? The forest preserves hold on to a lot more water in our land and less water ends up in your and my basement. So it's a win-win. And it's especially important because you can see how much the area has developed. The green was natural areas and the red was developed. You know, there's few red areas along here that were developed. And now look at this now. I mean, we if we didn't preserve these lands 100 or 70 years ago, they would all be, they would all be developed. So this was a video that showed that, but we can't activate it, apologies. And with that, because I can talk for hours, I'm going to stop. I'll let Benjamin talk. And then if we have questions, we can address those. So thank you so much for your patience and for listening to me. Keep those questions in mind. And um, I'll come back again. Thank you. Thank you, Isa. I'm Benjamin Cox, as I said before. I'm the executive director of Friends of the Forest Preserves. Uh, we have about 2,400 members here in Cook County. Next year, we'll be 25 years old, back when the, as I've said too many times, the forest reserves were a bit of a train wreck. Um, that's why we were formed. And um, I'm also the chair of the Vote Yes for Clean Air, Clean Water, and Wildlife campaign. So this is a very unique, uh, to Cook County anyway, countywide referendum. These happen in these, these happen in the collar counties quite often, but it's just not something that Cook County has tried since 1930. And before that, they did it a total of five times. Uh, for some reason, they just haven't done it since then. And once we get into my slides, I'll show you a little bit more about that. Friends uh, unites people to protect, promote, and care for the forest preserves in Cook County. Again, 2,400 members, tens of thousands of social media followers, and what's near and dear to my heart is that over 2,000 Conservation Corps members. We've been working to diversify the conservation field since uh, 2007 when we, and I got to work trying to do these programs almost as soon as I started in this job as the first exec, uh, first employee was the executive director of one for a while, it's pretty funny, back in 2004. Uh, now we have a staff of over 35 and in the summer we get over to, we get more than, uh, we have more than 200 people on the payroll with all of our summer high school programs. So as I mentioned, I'm the chair of the vote, the vote yes committee. I'll explain more about what that's all about. Uh, some of you have mar may have already seen it on your ballots. So ballots are available now. It's at kind of a weird position, but we, it's not too bad. It's actually a pretty good spot on the ballot. So tell your friends to find it. Uh, as Isa had, Isa had said, it's really kind of important to note some of these facts here. And I'll do a little bit of repeating and sort of the Venn diagram of our presentations tonight because I think you know hearing things multiple times is important especially as some of the best advocates and uh, influencers for this work are here in this room and on the zoom people are going to say hey how should I vote on that forest preserve thing and you're going to say vote yes it's really good the forest preserves are awesome and then some people might yeah, ask you some more questions and so we're going to give you some information to be able to do that this evening first oldest and largest forest preserve district it's a county-based conservation district there wasn't something like it anywhere else in the country until this one in Cook County. It's actually older than the National Park Service. There were national parks before that, 15 in fact, but the National Park Service started after this Forest Preserve District. Because folks, you know, when Chicago burned down, second city, right? Not because of New York, but because we rebuilt it. They said, we're gonna have free and clear lakefront, parks and boulevards in the city and forest preserves outside of the city. 
Some of the forest preserves are now in the city, but for the most part, they're outside of the city, and that was by design. Uh, before COVID, we had about 62 million visits a year, way more than in the Yellowstone National Park. Now, during COVID, we saw it jump to over 100 million visits a year. These places are incredibly important to people, and this is some of the most, it might be the most conservation land in and amongst the most people, the largest population of people of anywhere in the world. It's terribly important. 70,000 acres, easy to told you, that's half the city of Chicago. Another fact I like to say is that if you put it on a list of national parks, so there's 63 things that we call national parks in the National Park Service, it would be in the mid 40s. It's almost as big as Arches National Park, very iconic park. Obviously there's ones that are much, much larger, hundreds of thousands of acres, but they're not near people. They're terribly important. We love to visit them and all those things, but this is very accessible to people every day. There's nearly 200 and threatened endangered species. That sounds so depressing, but they actually get to live here. And the more restoration we do, the more that they can thrive here in this county. And Isa said this a little bit differently than I do, but this forest preserve district is a special unit of government. So by Illinois law, you know, we went downstate actually three times to try and make that happen in the early 1900s. And it kept getting defeated in the, in the uh, Supreme Court in Illinois. And once they passed the law, it became this special unit. And the other counties have copied with their own laws, but this one's unique. And they while they have the same commissioners as Cook County, just to make it confusing for all of us, as if voting here isn't confusing enough, it's a separate government. It's not a home rule government. They cannot raise their own taxes beyond some basic growth that they can do. Uh, and that was limited in the 1990s. And now it can get way too wonky. If you want to talk more later, we can. But two main ways to raise taxes is to go down state and ask state legislators to do it. And why does someone from Peoria or Carbondale want to raise taxes for Cook County and take that political hit? Or we can go to the voters. This is actually the third time we've made a strong effort to do this. We've done a lot of polling. We've talked to a lot of people throughout the county. We know this is a great time to actually work on this. We saw this before, just to reinforce, the things in green with the yellow around it are forest preserves. There's some tiny little pieces of green that are not forest preserves, but almost all the open space in this county, especially conservation-based, so it's more about nature and, and for people to get out and recreate in, is a uh, forest preserve district. We also have tons and tons of year-round programming. The forest preserves are open 365 days a year, dawn to dusk, they're free. You pay for a few things, but for the most part, everything's free. Nature centers, 40 fishing lakes, 350 miles of, of trails, marked trails, uh, hundreds of picnic groves. We could go on and on. And there's some really crazy things that people do, like dog sledding and, and uh, history walks in the forest, all kinds of interesting things, things out there. Okay, specifically on the ballot measure. I like to... You know, this this is you'll see the language on the next slide, but the main thing is that this money will go to do restoration work, to purchase more land, it will increase programming for individuals and families, and also uh, there will be a significant increase in jobs in the forest preserve, both full time jobs that don't require a college degree, and also uh, it will double conservation corps programming. This number, this 0.025% increase in the property tax limiting rate for me is about like a billion. It's like, what does that mean? I'm not sure, I have an idea. So it's a quarter of a 10th of a percent. So for most people, it's about $1.50, $1.60 per 100,000 of home value per year. The average house, it'll be about $20 a year. We saw when we were talking to people about it and we showed them the language before we explained it at all. And you'll see how clunky it is in a minute, they got it. They figured it out. Okay, that's some more money for the forest preserve. Looks like it's about, for my house, it'll be $14 a year. I like them, they're good for my family. It's a place I can get out of my neighborhood and do something with my kids. It's on this, it has to be on a countywide ballot. So it'll be on the November 8th uh, general, uh, midterm election. And here is the wonderful language you will see. It takes up a, almost the entire right column on the back page of the first, <laughs> of the first part of your ballot. You know, we have these very long and wonderful ballots in Illinois. Um, and like I said, it goes on and on and on, but we have a really good title. 
clean air, clean water, and wildlife habitat protection, one year limiting rate increase. Uh, and it kind of gets into what it's for there in the middle. And then it gives some examples. And pe again, when we were talking to folks, both in focus groups and through polling, they understood what this meant. Okay, so, the, so when you're talking to your friends and they say, okay, yeah, but, but really, what's, what's this all about? As it turns out, the things in the next century conservation plan that's pulled us all together and has us all rowing in the same direction under this administration with Tony Preckwinkle and the superintendent of the Forest Preserve, Arnold Randall, this plan was developed. We were all kind of doing whatever and we we're kind of tripping over each other at times. And this plan says, here's what we're all gonna do. Here's how we're gonna do it. Because there's hundreds of partners in Cook County that help with the Forest Preserve. And as it turns out, clean air and less pollution Holds very highly, but also uh, is one of the top things that we wanted to achieve with this work. We know that trees, all right, we're getting a little feedback. Trees filter out. Wait a moment. There we go. Maybe that'll help. Okay. Trees filter out the fine particulate matter that really leads to uh, asthma and other health conditions that really impact that. So the more trees we have, the more he healthy woodlands we have, the cleaner our air will be. Also, the forest preserves, as Isa said, are store 70 to 80% of the storm water in the county. And we know that if we can make the forest preserves healthier, that actually slows the water down. That bare ground does not have as many little stems on it. And so as the water pops around and hits those stems, it has to bump into them and slow down. And also there's little holes in the ground that it can go in. And we know the more we can keep it here and let it soak into the ground, the better that is for all of us. So this actually pr protects clean water for all of us. Protection for local habitat and wildlife through restoration, but also through acquisition. The Forest Preserve has very aggressive goals for acquisition of another 20,000 acres of land. If we spent every dime on this on this referendum on that, we would never get there. So there, we have to be very creative in all the other ways that we can raise money through grants and through partnerships with individuals. And they're starting to give you more uh, inter interesting with the methods that they're using to do that. We've talked a lot about restoration. That's gonna be a big part of this. And finally jobs, and I mentioned that earlier, but jobs will uh, increase again for individuals and you won't that don't require a college degree, but also for our Conservation Corps programs. Many of the participants in that are from the south and west sides of Chicago. This says 150 plus organizations and growing in the coalition, including the League of Women Voters, which was something we worked on for a very long time, and we're very happy to have you with us. There's actually nearly 170 organizations at this point, and it's not just nonprofits, there's museums. There's little theater groups, there's uh, recreation groups, but also corporations are signing on. We've got some really significant union support here because they benefit from, from this both through what it will do for pensions. It will fix the Forest Preserve's pension problem. And theirs is one of the least problematic uh, of any of our governments in Illinois and this will solve that. But also it creates more jobs for them too. You can see all of these. Um, oh, here, I'll show you that in a moment. So early voting starts on the 24th. I think you can actually do super site polling now, right? Voting now, yes, thank you. Starting tomorrow? Yes, okay. You can already have requested your mail-in ballot. Those are accepted all the way up to election day. And of course you can vote on election day. So you can go to voteyesforcepreserves.com or .org and get all this information and more. That's the specific website for this campaign. And then we also are on a lot of different social media. We've gotten really, really strong support from the philanthropic community, from the civic leaders who like the ones that started the Forest Preserves. Today, these folks are helping lead this campaign. There's been a really significant amount of money raised for this campaign. We're gonna be on social media, but on TV, on radio, and also in print. And you'll see that, uh, you should have already seen some of that start now. And if you notice this week and last week, we've gotten a lot of editorial support, both from the Tribune, who was like kind of a shocking full-throated endorsement. They endorsed it last summer when we got the commission, when we needed the commissioners to vote on it, but they, they actually came on even stronger. 
I would say in this uh, editorial the other day, the Chicago Sun-Times also supported it, and you'll see a lot more of that coming. Okay, the, the one other thing you can ask folks to do, because this actually works. Yeah, you guys, thanks, Deb. Thank you. Uh, is you ask folks to go to the website. There's a spot to pledge that you'll vote for this. And it's this weird science that we know. If people actually pledge to you or someone else to vote for this, they will. And it's just like a reinforced thing, and they'll remember to do it. Okay, I think we'll go back to questions. That's the end of this presentation. And um, here you go, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin and Isa. So we want to first open the floor, the audience here in person, to questions. Um, so um, thank you both for the wonderful presentations and so much great information. Um, with all that information, does anybody in the room have any questions? Sure. This is a frivolous question, but tell us about Billy the Buffalo. Did the Forest Preserve keep him safe? I think you may be referring to the bison that um, escaped from a farm in Lake County. That was in Lake County, closer to Wisconsin. Yep, just one county up. And that bison was eventually safely uh, brought back to the farm where it lives. But thank you for bringing this up. Maybe uh, we can start dreaming big for something we can do in, I don't know, 50 years, bring Hugh Bison back. Hi, you mentioned land acquisition. Um, what characteristics of the land do you look for? Great question. Uh, so we uh, have a few plans. Actually, if you go on the Forest Preserve website, we have a Southeast Land Acquisition Plan. Uh, we have an internal one that's a little more specific. We, you know, we can put it out there because speculations. Uh, but we hope to acquire land A, where land is still available. Uh, we do take land donations if they're fit with our um, mission and are a good connector. But we look for areas that might be protecting creeks that um, drain through our properties. We look for um, properties that connect maybe to other places, um, you know, to other pieces of property, so to create corridors for wildlife, uh, but also in areas where we might not have as much of a presence in forest preserves. We're looking to uh, fix that by acquiring land, uh, putting it into recreation, maybe sort of light touch conservation and restoration now, and then with funds, do it more, um, do a deeper dive into that because that does take time, does take money and resources. Uh, so, but we do have a big push for the southeast side of the county, A, because there's still ag land there that is available that we can purchase, and two, for uh, just for <laughs> social justice reasons, and we don't have as much presence there as we do in some other areas. But we did just acquire some land on the northwest side that connected two other pieces of land. So it's some of it is opportunistic, some of it is with our funds. We apply for a lot of grants. Um, So it says here that this is one year limiting rate increase. What does that mean? So that's that's very jargony language. It means that the limiting rate increase will happen once and then it's permanent. So you'll see we'll go from 0.049% and we'll add 0.025 to that. So it's still less than a percent. Um, for most people, or, you know, you, you get the one tax bill a year that says how bad the pensions are. You get the other tax bill that says that shows how much of your property tax is going to each thing. For almost everyone, the last thing is the Forest Preserve District. And yet it's like maybe one of the most positive things that we get after schools, I would say. But right, like it's it's, you know, police are important. Fire is important. You know, the jails, the courts, all that. But at the end of the day, that you know, this thing is really bringing something very positive to us. So that's a great question. Oh, I'll I guess let I'm you in keep line. going up, Sorry. <laughs> um, um, I think we might have all seen this amazing video about Yellowstone and it, reintroducing the wolves and how it completely changed. The, and um, that has me thinking, uh, 
you mentioned what a wolf is a, our only natural predator. I mean, what are we doing about? Um, I mean, over overgrowth of uh, you know deer eating bark and starving. I mean, what 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 are some of your plans, and how have you how have you handled that? Yeah, so we um, do partner with USDA on deer management and uh, with the referendum that would increase, uh, our funding would increase for that. It's tricky because we are in a highly urbanized area um, and where deer are not under our jurisdiction, they're a state property. Uh, so yes, as our, uh, yes. So, but we do a partner with the USDA, so they're the feds who come in and um, help us with deer management. And then that varies from year to year. And in years where we also test a lot of deer for different zoonotic diseases. And if we have a positive case, then we're able to do uh, more testing and more management. Uh, a lot of our deer populations, because they are so dense, are actually unhealthy. Um, so it, it's, it's hard, but sometimes for if you are an animal lover, you will be promoting less density in deer because they will be healthier. Um, so there are a lot of homeless people that live in the forest preserve in the summer particularly. Is there uh, any kind of a plan for dealing with homeless, managing, helping, relocating the homeless? Uh, there is, so we have a police department uh, in within the forest preserves of Cook County. So they are more trained on like positive human interaction and wildlife conservation issues. And when we do find homeless individuals in our forest preserves, um, we have wraparound services that we try to provide to them. Now, some people will take advantage of it and some will not, um, but we do do that. Uh, and then also from our deer management, um, the meat is tested, and if it's uh, good, then it's donated to the uh, food pantries, the uh, Greater Chicagoland Food uh, Depository. So we donate about, I think, 14,000 pounds of meat every year. And that is rare because uh, food banks often do not get fresh protein. So, if, you know, if you do those food drives at uh, places like at workplaces, a lot of times they say we want dry socks, toothbrushes and fish or protein or we're, we're doing the protein part. Are you going into competition with the legislature for the power to impose a tax? Uh, I'm not sure exactly. I don't quite understand your question, but the legislature, I, I hear, I, I think I can answer it. The legislature are the ones that provided this method for arriving at a property tax increase. And, and, and actually, what we've seen is that both sides of the aisle are conservation supporters. Also, we've seen Republicans like this because it goes to people and they get to decide what's going to happen. So they make that language super clunky like we were seeing before on purpose because they don't really want to make this very easy for local governments. They we really had uh, kind of a boom on tax increases that they wanted to put a stop to back in the 90s. And this these PTEL laws, and I could go on and on, like I said before, limited how easy or how challenging it might be to be able to do this. And so this is not a minor effort that we're pulling together here to put this on the ballot and to run this grassroots effort. If you notice, Isa won't say anything about whether or not you should vote for this or not, because she can't as a Forest Preserve employee. Uh, if she was off the clock and not here with her pin and not here as an official representative, she could talk about it, but she can't as an employee. I can't because Friends of the Forest Preserves and our many partners are helping to move this initiative forward. Uh, and it's an, a, a historic effort. It's a big deal. And it's really, uh, it's actually been a, a whole lot of fun. And it, it'll, it'll be really fun on November 8th, we hope. I saw Hank's question here. Uh, what's the difference between a forest preserve and a nature preserve. Hank Saunders is a huge supporter of this effort as a regular volunteer with this. She's also a volunteer on the Conservation of Policy Council that oversees that forest preserve plan. Um, and she's been a long time supporter of Friends and other conservation organizations here in Cook County. And thank you, Hank. Uh, a 
a nature preserve means, you know, we've talked a little bit about health and about quality. There's different measurements on what makes a forest preserve special or a natural area special, like how good is it? In other words, if a kind of a picky special species that can't really be found anywhere else likes a forest preserve spot, that means we're doing something right or we, utter, we, we better hurry up and save that spot to make sure that that species stays and survives. And once you can recognize an area as being healthy, restored, thriving, it can get designated as a nature preserve. We actually have a nature preserve commissioner here tonight, one of our employees, Radha Moralia. Radhika Moralia is a Friends of the Forest Preserves uh, program director, but also she's now on the Nature Preserves Commission. So, um, yeah. Uh, the only thing I want to add that um, just last Thursday, we have a beautiful gravel prairie nature preserve. It's called Shoe Factory Road Nature Preserve. Well, the state employees went to every few years. They look at, you know, the quality, making sure that we are keeping up to the task and our responsibility. And the fantastic news was they looked around, they looked at their map records and they said, well, the grade A and grade B quality has extended. So we now have to make the boundaries bigger. So we're adding acreage and that is um, extremely exciting and encouraging and a testament to the fantastic job that we've been doing. And I can't take credit for it because I've been there only seven months or here, uh, but the staff is really dedicated. And I think that is a, a great way to illustrate that. Hello, and thank you so much for this presentation. It's been wonderful. I'd like to ask you to please address the questions we now have. And we did mute the participants. So Jennifer asks, please tell listeners, well, there we go again. And can you tell us about what makes a nature preserve different from the regular forest preserve from Hank? And I'd like to invite anybody else on the Zoom to please post your questions now. And I thank everybody for joining us. Do you have more to say on the difference? Okay. While we're waiting. While we're waiting and soliciting some questions from the Zoom folks, I wanted to ask um, an important question to voters, I think, is is how often has a referendum like this ever been proposed and what are, what's the track record? So outside of Cook County and the Collar Counties, they've done this regularly. And often they're doing it for land acquisition, something that people really understand when it comes to raising your taxes. They know it's gonna actually do something that might have not be a permanent increase like we had talked about, but a X amount of dollars that they use to acquire land. So there's something in the, I don't know, $20 billion or something has been raised. And for whatever reason, it ha has not happened here in Cook County. Um, this one's a little different because it's a permanent increase. Right now, the budget every year is about $130 million. By comparison, Cook County's budget's $9 billion. And so it's this is this tiny little amount per acre. This forest preserve district is wildly underfunded and understaffed, and yet it's the largest. And it also has the most people using it and living near it. Um, so this tax increase, while it would be about $20 a year for my house, the average house, <coughs> will bring in about $43 million a year for the forest preserve. Their annual operating budget is about 63 million a year. So this 43 would be a huge shot in the arm. Well, I don't think there's <laughs> What do you see as the biggest obstacle to getting this passed? The biggest challenge that we have is for people to know what it is and to have heard about it. And that's why we've worked so hard on building a big coalition. You know, most folks are gonna get their ballot and they're just gonna have to read it and see how it goes. We're fortunate again, that when we talked to folks, we saw that without any education, we were pulling very, very hard. What happens during the polling is you then slide. And so the biggest challenge would have been opposition, which we're not seeing. And we were sure to talk to some folks that have done some opposition in some elections, maybe the last one, two years ago that we saw. Somebody who's becoming a Floridian did a lot of uh, opposition on something and won. He's kind of pro conservation. One of our board, one of our committee chairs is friends with him. They talked about it. We talked to the 
the other committee chair is a realtor. Uh, he also talked to realtors and they're fine with it. The unions are good with it. Um, there is one sort of anti-tax thing going on right now, but it's not pointed at us. So we're just thinking people love forest preserves and we hope it works. And the, and the other challenge is where is this item on the ballot? Buried in the middle of the judges, isn't that great? <laughs> However, we actually saw one the other day and it's the whole right column on the back. And you know, it, judge things are these little lines, you know, I mean, we've all done it. And at least this is a nice big, you know, kind of obvious and it's got a great ballot tie in too, so. I don't know if we got more questions from the Zoom. Do you have more? Um, with the increase in the money, um, are you going to more look to the forest preserves as keeping natural areas, or are you going to look more to recreational use? Both. <laughs> Both. Uh, so a research management department will get about $4 million more, which will allow us to hire another crew, research technician crew, uh, get uh, maybe more wildlife staff, at some some uh, administrative support, but th there's other departments, and we have a sub department which is conservation and experiential programming. And they will also get a big boost thanks to this, which will allow them to hire community liaisons, partner with partners, and maybe help to partner on uh, bringing more people to forest preserves for recreation, but also for other activities so people don't see forest preserves as just for nature or just for biking or just for hiking. You know, if you have a local knitting club and you meet at the library, well, maybe during summer months you meet at the forest preserve and you love that place then. And that love will then ensure that the place is protected forever. One thing to that is you know, friends in the forest preserves had a pretty adversarial relationship when I got there because it was a mess. And I was the first employee. Volunteers had been around for six or eight years working on sort of saying, hey, this is a great, wonderful institution. It's being run horribly. We need to fix that. What could we do together to do that? Our relationship has pivoted dramatically to where, you know, I sit on the, on the steering committee co-chair for that plan we've talked a lot about, and we work together very closely. We have really strong programs together. And yet I can still say, hey, uh, you, you can't give that land away. We had to do it two weeks ago. Um, that's a whole different story. It was a minor thing, but it was precedent and we really push hard on those things. Um, my, you know, the, the number one use of the forest preserves is trails and trails are for people. And that's the kind of activity that gets people out in nature enjoying it, which has tremendous physical benefits, but also mental health benefits this crazy place that's so loud and dirty and all those things, they knew 100 years ago that you needed that for respite and it, it still stays true today. And that recreation is one of the three key uh, tenets of the Forest Preserve's mission, education, pleasure, and recreation. So we're very pro-recreation. The Forest Preserves currently cannot afford to have dedicated trails crews. And so I've been bugging the superintendent for several years now that if this happens, we need that because the trails are terribly important for all of us. Our trails will also have better signage uh, with that finding, which uh, we're trying to incorporate into any grant that affects trails, that signage now becomes part of the package deal because it's uh, not extremely expensive. However, it sort of always gets pushed to the side and we know it's really important for um, users and for their user experience. So trails are becoming a big thing and uh, trail signage is becoming extremely important too. If you guys have any final thoughts you'd like to add, we're gonna wrap up the discussion now. I wanna say that having both of you here is such a wonderful privilege for all of us to get to hear from some of the experts. The Cook County Forest Preserves have a long history and this is a moment on that timeline when we get to make a, make a decision together as a society to promote further ourselves and our surrounding environment. So with that. Oh, yes, okay. Well, so there will be another event focused on the Cook County Forest Preserve referendum, specifically regarding the nature preserves within the Cook County Forest Preserves. So the Cook County Forest Preserves, like Benjamin and Isa have explained, 
big preserve system with some very, very high quality nature within it that have been preserved as nature preserves, having the highest degree of protection that is um, uh, allowed or achievable. And that protection um, is at a greater acreage or greater number of preserves at the Cook County Forest Preserves than any other institution besides the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. So the state owns most of the nature preserves. Cook, Co Cook County owns the next greatest amount of nature preserves. So with the nature preserves in focus next week on October 12th, um, please join us for that discussion as um, folks who care for and engage the nature preserves within the Cook County Forest Preserves, which I know is a little bit confusing. Um, they'll be talking about the value of those preserves, the impact on their lives, and uh, why it's important to support the Forest Preserve referendum for biodiversity and the impact it has on people's lives. I'll just say thanks to Matt for moderating. Thanks to Isa for helping me look better here tonight with all of her great knowledge. <laughs> Thanks to the league for having us, both leagues, Union League and the League of Women Voters. And please remember to tell folks to vote yes, find us in the middle of the ballot, and we'll all celebrate on November 8th. Thank you. Well, thank you to everyone for being here, um, and especially to our environmental committee. Uh, the, the League of Women Voters of Chicago has an absolutely incredible environmental action committee that, you know, every day sort of inspires me with, you know, their commitment to bringing environmental issues, environmental activism, and, you know, the politics of, you know, the environment to our league work. I feel like it's definitely been like a big missing piece in a lot of our advocacy. Um, you know, a, a big thank you to the Union League Club who has been a partner with us on these series. Uh, this recording will be made available online. So definitely, you know, feel free to share with your network who could not be with us tonight. Um, it's incredibly important, you know, this referenda and, you know, I, I hope it passes in November. Um, so definitely, you know, it's great information and thank you to all of our speakers for being here, you know, your passion for the environment, you know, uh, the forest preserves and the environment and the ecosystem in Illinois is incredibly inspirational. And I hope, you know, everyone can kind of take away like, you know, getting out and enjoying, you know, what we have to offer here in Cook County and beyond, um, you know, whether it's trails or, you know, any of the numerous activities that are you know available to us so thank you to everyone for being here